When with pleasure you are viewing any work that one is doing and you like him or you love him, tell him now. Don't withhold your approbation till the parson makes orations and he lies with snowy lilies on his brow. For no matter how you shout it, he won't know a thing about it. He won't know of any teardrops you have shed. If you think that praise is due him, now's the time to show it to him, because a man can't read his tombstone when he's dead. Welcome to the Seven Hats Podcast. My name is Yuval Selig, and I've been on the entrepreneurial roller coaster for over 20 years. I've experienced it all throughout my journey, the grind, burnout, failure, and ultimately, success. The turning point for me was realizing that building a successful company is meaningless if you neglect the other significant areas of your life. So today, I'm inviting you to join me on an adventure through those seven areas, what I call the seven hats. Every week, my guests and I will drop valuable insights and pearls of wisdom, helping, motivating, and inspiring you to get your seven hats in order and deliver real impact with meaning. So let's get going. Welcome, Seven Hatters. I have a very special treat for you today. In this episode, we speak with Jim Cathcart and dive into hats one, three, four, and seven. The soul, the servant, the entrepreneur, and the seeker as we get schooled on life from one of the world's greatest success and motivational mentors, speakers, entrepreneurs, and authors. Jim is one of the top five most award-winning speakers in the world. His top 1% TEDx video has over 2.4 million views. His 21 books are translated into multiple languages, including three international bestsellers. With over 40 years as a professional speaker, Jim has delivered more than 2,700 presentations to audiences worldwide. He is listed in the Professional Speaker Hall of Fame, a recipient of the prestigious Golden Gavel Award, along with Earl Nightingale, Art Linkletter, Zig Ziglar, and many others, has been the president of the National Speakers Association and received the Cavett Award for a lifetime of service. He was listed as one of the top 100 minds on personal development by Leadership Excellence Magazine. The San Diego chapter of the National Speakers Association renamed their Member of the Year Award the Jim Cathcart Service Award, and the Greater Los Angeles chapter gave Jim the Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2008, he was inducted as one of the legends of the speaking profession. And if those accomplishments were not enough, I found Jim to be a down-to-earth, regular guy. He is a family man, married for 51 years, a rock and roll musician, and an avid motorcyclist. Someone recently said, Jim Cathcart is what Fonzie would have been if he'd gone to business school. Our conversation consisted of one great story and life lesson after another. And at the end of our talk, I knew that Jim was one of my heroes and mentors, and I know he will be yours as well. I can't hold back the excitement any longer. So with that, let's welcome Jim to the Seven Hats. Jim? Yes. Welcome to the Seven Hats. Thank you. It's wonderful for me to be here. I'm, I've been looking forward to this. Awesome. You know, I have to say, helping entrepreneurs has been a passion of mine for so many years now. Mm -hmm. So when I have a chance to speak with someone such as yourself, who has been successfully changing lives for over 40 years now, I get really, really excited. Thank and you. And I can promise that we're only going to scratch the surface in this interview, but nonetheless... I predict that this episode is going to be transformational for many of our seven hatters. So if you don't mind, I believe our beginnings can tell us a lot about our life's journey. And I think we will learn so much of who Jim became by going back to where it all started. Okay. So where were you born, Jim? And how was your childhood like? I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. For those internationally, that's the center southern portion of the United States. My dad was a telephone repairman. By the way, I was born in 1946, so that puts it in context. I'll save you the math. It's 76, <laughs> 75 years going on 76. Um, my dad was a telephone repairman, and he traveled most of the time. He was gone during the week, home on the weekends. 
My mom was there with me and my little sister. My grandfather had a stroke and didn't speak or move on his own for the rest of his life, seven years. And he was in our front bedroom in a hospital bed. And my mother and my grandmother took care of him, although mom had to also take care of my grandmother and us two kids while dad was gone. Problem. When mom grew up, she was she grew up in an uh, in a family where dad was gone all the time for months on end, and uh, her mom died when she was five years old. So she was being raised by her maiden aunt who lived on a farm in rural Louisiana, and uh, seldom saw her dad. knew nothing about parenting or raising kids, anything like that. At age fifteen, her dad had remarried. Uh, emotionally, not physically, but emotionally abusive woman. And mom said, I'm done and ran away from home at 15 years old, never went back. So she'd been on her own all those years. And then during the war, she was out in during World War II, she was in California. She had met my dad before she left. And when he came back from the war, they got on a train, came back to Arkansas and got married. And soon thereafter, I was conceived. As a matter of fact, I know when I was conceived on their honeymoon at the Peabody Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, where I've stayed since then as an adult. <laughs> and uh, um, so mom was really struggling, didn't know how to raise kids. And, and uh, we were a handful, but we weren't bad kids. We were, you know, we were just uh, having a normal childhood. I thought that was normal and life was always like that. And I had a lot of good friends and I never got in trouble. You know, I didn't do, do illegal things or I wasn't mean or a bully or anything like that, although I met a few. And so that's how I grew up. And I expected to be normal, ordinary. You know, dad worked for the phone company. I figured, well, I'll, I'll go to high school and graduate and then I'll go to work for the phone company and, and I'll go to work in an office. So I don't have to travel all the time and I'll become a manager. And at 65, I'll retire and die. With a gold watch. Yeah, with a gold watch, probably. (laughs) Gold plated. (laughs) You know, that's what I envisioned for my life. What did your parents envision for you? Pretty much the same. You know, they didn't say that, but they didn't. They also didn't say, you know, you could do anything you choose to do. They didn't say you're capable of changing the world or whatever. They they said, uh, you know, you're smart. You look nice. uh, You're a good guy. Have a good life. You know, do the responsible thing. And they did teach me, you know, to to be honest, to be disciplined and responsible and accountable. And if I broke something, I made it right. You know, if I uh, damaged something that belonged to someone else, I paid for it, you know, on my own, not with my parents money. And so when I went to my dad when I was very young and said, Hey, can I have some money? He said, sure. Take the lawnmower and go mow some lawn. <laughs> and it was one of those old push mowers, not the kind with gasoline in it. You know, it was <laughs> like that. It's really that was my dad. He made my, he, yeah, that was my dad. He made me and all my friends work at, in, the, in the backyard. So as a kid, you never imagined you would become a world-class. I never even thought I would write an article, you know. I, really? Let alone 22 books. Do you remember the event that made you realize that you wanted to change people's lives oh, through yeah. speaking? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was uh, 1972. I was newly married, baby at home, 50 pounds overweight, two-pack-a-day smoker, had never been an athlete, never been a scholar. You know, I hadn't excelled in school. I'd made an A in the classes I liked and Bs and Ds and Cs in the classes I didn't particularly care about. And I uh, hadn't been on any of the teams for more than half a season, swimming team. And then I dropped out because I got a cold and it was wintertime. And, um, mom wouldn't let me go out for football because she was afraid I'd get hurt. And so I didn't do that. So here I was, 1972, no college degree, no money in the bank, no connections. And I'm sitting there in my office. I'm an assistant to a guy named Bob Moore, and Bob Moore is not busy. So he doesn't need an assistant. So I'm bored to tears. And it's the Urban Renewal Agency, Little Rock Housing Authority. I'm an assistant loan specialist. And I'm reading books on urban renewal, and that doesn't excite me. And that's a problem because that's where I'm working. So I read the Bible cover to cover at work. 
in a three month period. I had that much spare time. And then one day in the next room, the radio was playing and it was the voice of Earl Nightingale, the Dean of Personal Motivation. He was on 900 radio stations back then. And he said that day, and this is an exact quote of what he said in 1972. So that tells you how profound the impact can be of one statement at the time a mind is open and in need of it. Absolutely. He said, if you will spend one extra hour every day studying your chosen field, in five years or less, you'll be a national expert on that subject. And in seven years, you will be a world expert. And I said, wait a minute. Well, I don't want to be an expert on urban renewal. I've got an, a heck, an hour a day. I've got eight hours a day. I'm a government clerk. What do I want to study? Didn't know. Kept thinking about it and thinking about it. About a week or so later, it occurred to me, I want to do what he does. But I didn't know what he does, you know, or what he did. So I thought, um, what do I do? And then it hit me. He just told me, spend an extra hour every day focused only on one subject, in my case, personal development. And so I started studying the field that he was coming from, and I got all the classic books, which I have right here behind me, some of them, you know, Think and Grow Rich, Power of Positive Thinking, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, you know, all the classic motivational books from the early era. Mm -hmm. And um, As a Man Thinketh and you know, I was completely immersed in this. And then I joined the Junior Chamber of Commerce, the JCs. And at that time, the JCs had 350,000 members. They were huge because their market was young men, young adults. It wasn't male and female back then, it is now. And uh, so their motto was young men can change the world. What? And they had a book about that, which I read like three or four times. And unlike, say, a Lions Club or a Rotary or, you know, Optimist Club or something like that, Sir Toma, JC's purpose is leadership training, and they use community service as their, their lab. So if I was going to run a March of Dimes walkathon to raise funds for the March of Dimes, I would have to follow their chairman's planning guide and write out a written plan for it in advance, submit it to my local chapter. They would say, yep, looks like you're ready to go, or no, you need to do this and this also. And then I would conduct the, the program and then, you know, recruit all the volunteers to help. And at the end, I would evaluate it and submit the evaluative, uh, evaluation for um, acknowledgement, you know, like win an award or, or get a pat on the back or whatever. So every project anybody did, that's the way we did it. Well, I joined in... Uh, January of 73, I think it was. And over the next two years attended, wait for it, 400 JC's meetings after work. 400. That's fanaticism. So every night I was going to a JC's meeting somewhere. There was my local JC's and then I got involved in the district and then the region, and then the state. And then I became the state chairman in charge of leadership training. And so I was going around and leading group discussions using their manuals uh, to teach per interpersonal skills, goal setting, things like that. 400 meetings, you get pretty good at it by the 301st, you know. So the first year I was lame and awkward, but I was the guy that raised his hand and volunteered. And by, oh, I don't know, 80 or 100 of those meetings, I was getting really confident and becoming better and better at it. And by the 200th or so, people were calling and saying, hey, I understand you're really good at this. Could you come to our group? And even businesses were hiring me and saying, hey, we'll give you, you know, 50 bucks if you'll come and speak at our thing. And so that's how I got started in the field of personal development. And my goal, because of the JC's influence, was to literally be able to change the world for the better through the work that I was doing. And during that time when you started feeling better about yourself, did you really imagine ever reaching greatness at that time? Oh, he while you heavens were going, no. You no, didn't. I, I figured, you know, I'll go to work. I went to work uh, in 1974 selling Earl Nightingale's motivational tapes door to door. The motivational tapes on the top shelf of my, my bookcase behind me. 
I've still got one basic set, and it was a five hundred sixty dollar audio cassette library. Remember cassettes? Wow! And so it was. That's minutes. a lot back in those days. Oh, that was a a ton. You know, that was more than most people, many people's mortgages. And um, yeah. so I would go around and I would play one of those twenty minute cassettes, and so I'd say, "What would happen if you heard that every day of your life? Only that message right there." And the people would say, well, that's inspiring and profound. It would cause me to be a better person. What would that be worth to you? Well, you know, it, it would change a lot of things. And then I'd play them another or a portion of another, and I'd show them the whole library of messages. And they would say, well, how much? You know, 500 sick. Oh, God, you know, sticker shock. And I'd walk them through that. And I made a few sales. And so that was my entry into the business. Well, in 1974, when I was already, uh, when I was selling Earl Nightingale tapes, I never envisioned that I would do anything other than get into that business and work in the state of Arkansas. In 1984, I was in San Diego, California. My office was in La Jolla by the beach. I had uh, formed a business partnership with a college professor, Dr. Tony Alessandra, who wanted to do what I was doing. I answered the phone one day and it was Earl Nightingale himself calling me. He asked to speak to me. I almost fainted. He said, uh, I just read an article you wrote and I think it would make a good audio cassette album. We produce those. I said, oh, believe me, sir, I know. <laughs> and uh, he said, I said, it is an audio album. We produced it on our own. He said, send it to me. If I like it, we'll publish it. Well, I sent it to him. He said, if you'll re-record it, we will publish it. So we did. And it was titled Relationship Strategies for Dealing with the Differences in People. It was, it was the first audio album ever widely published on the subject of personality types, 1984. It sold three and a half million dollars worth in the first two years. We went, Tony and I, went from nobody to world famous in two years. And we're getting requests for speeches in Australia and South Africa and Canada and, you know, all over Europe. Uh, oh, my gosh. You know, <laughs> blows my mind. Wow. Yeah. In your book, The Acorn Principle, you mentioned Harold Gash, a mm -hmm. salesman of Earl Nightingale, so yep. much speaking about him, and who came up to you after one of your talks and said, Jim, you have more potential than any young man that I've ever known. Yep. True. And that statement changed your life. Oh, How did really? it change your life? Well, Harold was a, a distributor for Earl Nightingale's recordings. He and Bob Proctor, who is a, a well-known guru in the, in the self-help field, who just passed away, sadly, the other day at age 87. Um, yep. And I knew Bob. I, I served on some panels and programs with him. Uh, inspiring guy. Anyway, Harold Gash came to a JC's meeting, heard me give a presentation, and he said, come outside. We went out and we sat in his gold Cadillac. And not that anyone noticed it was a gold Cadillac. <laughs> and he said, Jim, you have more potential than any young man I've ever known. Well, I didn't know how many he'd known, but I figured it had, couldn't be many. He said, I think you ought to come to work with me and sell Earl Nightingale's motivational program. I said, Harold, I've tried selling and I'm no good at it. He said, <laughs> he laughed and he said, no, you have not. He said, you tried selling awkwardly and you weren't any good at it. But if you were to sell to others the way you were selling that audience today, you're an exceptionally good salesperson and you can, you can succeed at it. And I said, well, what, you know, explain, please. And so he did. And then he gave me a, a, a 48 cassette or 48 recording audio album of Nightingale. Uh, which was a big library of things that looked like books but had cassettes inside each. He said, this is $560. You take this home and listen to it for a month. And I said, well, I can't afford $560, and there's no way my wife would go for it either. That's more than our rent and, and more than my income, which was $525. And he said, well, you listen to it for a month, and at the end of the month— if you don't think this will change your life and, and you want to keep it, then you bring it back to me. But if you do want to go this direction, 
figure out how to pay for it. And I said, yes, sir. And I went home with the dedication to get every ounce of knowledge and inspiration I could out of there before I had to take it back. I had no intention of buying. On the last day of the month, after me fanatically, and I mean that in the textbook sense of the word fanaticism, listening to those recordings every day and making notes like crazy, I was packing them up to take them back, and my wife said, you don't want to return them, do you? And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, why don't you keep them? Now, let me translate. Oh. That means, Jim, I've seen such a profound change in you over the last 30 days. I don't want to go back to the old Jim. So I wow. went to Harold and worked out a payment plan. And then I went out and I represented the Nightingale programs, you know, selling door to door to businesses in Little Rock. And that was the beginning of my speaking career. And wow, I, I just think back on that and think, why did I have to pay full price when I was going to be buying them at wholesale and selling at retail? <laughs> he said, it's because if you're not willing to pay full, full price, you will always feel like you're ripping them off and you ought to discount it. And you'll try dropping your price to get the sale. He said, don't do that. It's worth $560. And sure enough, wow, what a lesson. I sold it. What a lesson. And, you know, more importantly, the support of your wife mm -hmm. at that time, because mm -hmm. not every entrepreneur has the support of their loved one. And Ooh. I think that's so important for success. Well, let me add something. Years later, when I had really achieved some substantial things in my field, Paula said to me, you know, I didn't help at all. You did this on your own. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, you didn't doubt me. You didn't make me second guess myself. You didn't make it hard for me to do what I needed to do. She said, yeah, but I didn't, you know, really support and encourage you either. I said, yeah, but that would have been a bonus. The other would have been a real negative and would have discouraged me and I might have given up. It, but you didn't do that. I said, so thank you. And yes, you did contribute a lot. And uh, let's do more. I have chills because my wife, Allah, so many times throughout my career as an entrepreneur, when I gave her the credit for my success, she declined to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And I kept on reminding her that she doesn't have to sit at the desk to make it happen. She just has to support yeah. and be there and facilitate the actions that, that I need to take and feel good about those actions exactly. and make things happen. Yeah. It's just See, it's if, so important. If you've got somebody you love and you want to impress... And you do the things that, that should impress them, you know, reasonable things that should impress them, and they never acknowledge, then you feel unfulfilled. There's, there's an incomplete transaction going on. You know, it's an open-ended account yep. laying on top of the desk. No one ever did the paperwork. Yep. So the thing that, that spouses can do for each other is first listen and observe and find out what the, your mate is trying to do. What, what are they dreaming about and wanting and going for. And then as they make progress on it, notice it out loud, acknowledge it. Hey, that's a lot better than the last time. Or, hey, you know, like in my case, I play guitar and sing. And uh, I do that. That's my side gig. But I do it seriously. You know, I'm, I really take it seriously. I still do that today. And when I'm in good voice and I'm playing well, you know, it just absolutely nurtures my soul if, if Paula or someone says, boy, you sound good today, you know, or, oh, I like the way you did that song or, you know, just anything like that. Any kind of, of acknowledgement is because acknowledgement is so rare. It's just pure refined platinum. You know, it's not just gold. It's better than that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And on the, and on the flip side, it's also encouragement to do better. It's not oh, criticism, but yeah. encouragement to do better. And yeah. I think when my wife, Allah, she sees something that, she, you know, from the outside perspective, she doesn't like, she tells me, Yeah, but she tells me in a way that reinforces the change. Right. Uh -huh. And I think that's really important. So but let, let me, let me interrupt you for a second. I want to add a little bit of a poem that I just remembered that fits this. Uh, I think the the author of it was Burton Braley, but I'm not sure. But it's 
when with pleasure you are viewing any work that one is doing and you like him or you love him, tell him now. Don't withhold your approbation till the parson makes orations and he lies with snowy lilies on his brow. For no matter how you shout it, he won't know a thing about it. He won't know of any teardrops you have shed. If you think that praise is due him, now's the time to show it to him, because a man can't read his tombstone when he's dead. Wow. Isn't that a beautiful piece of work? I'm going to pause for just one second to let that sink in. That was amazing. Thank that you. That was amazing. Thank you for that. Thanks you for bet. sharing. That was from the 1970s when I first heard that. Ah, I, I knew that this episode is just going to have a whole bunch of nuggets. So let's continue. So you dedicated your life to speaking, yep. of course, and mentoring others. So in the spirit of growth. Helping people grow. The, that was the slogan I came up with back in the 70s. Helping people grow. Personal growth. I love that. So in the spirit of growth, let's mm -hmm. dive into your life's work. Well, by the way, that's the way I sign my letters. In the spirit of growth. In the spirit. Yes. I love that. I that's started awesome. in 1974 or five signing that way. Wow. Well, listen, everyone's got to have a signature and you ha you definitely have yours and probably many of them. So you wrote a book titled The Acorn Principle, you know, as we discussed earlier. If you want to produce great acorns, you said, think like an oak, not an acorn. And in the book, you speak of nurture your nature, mm -hmm. find out how rich, full, and rewarding your life can be. Now, I love analogies, so let's talk about the acorn. Okay. Tell us about the parts of the acorn and how they relate to nurturing our nature. Excellent. I'm holding in my hand a wooden acorn that is quite a beautiful example of one. If you'll notice, any acorn has three parts. It has a stem that connects it to the tree. It has a cap that holds onto the seed. And then it has the seed itself, which falls out of the cap at some point and grows into a, a plant or ultimately a tree, which could then produce millions of acorns over the years of its existence. Okay. So if you look at this metaphorically, the stem represents the connection of this to the past. That stem represents everyone in your line, your human you know, genetic line that has ever existed back to the beginning of, of recorded time. So you have in your DNA, the imprint of all that existed before you in your line. So you have a legacy within you. The cap holds onto the seed until it's ready to grow on its own. So that's your parents, your coaches, your mentors, your guides, your role models, your heroes, right? All of those that directed you in one way or another or protected you. And then the seed represents the potential that still lives within you. But more than that, it represents the potential that will be passed along to all future generations through every life nice. you touch not just through children you have, but through every life you touch. So you have within you already the seed of potential to do great things in, good, in, in small ways and in, in large ways. But you have the potential to do that. And when I say you, I mean everyone listening to this message, not just you. So nurture that nature and express it in the most appropriate and most helpful ways that you can and whether it's picking up a piece of trash you didn't throw down or saying, hey, nice work on that to someone you don't even know or smiling at a beggar who's sitting in, in, uh, in the dirt and begging for coins, you know, and, and acknowledging them as a fellow human being, whatever it is, do the good you're capable of doing. And notice none of those things require money, education or special skills. Wow. So let's continue down that road. Okay. okay. So. In one of your previous talks, you told the audience the following. You said, the future you see defines the person you'll be. Yeah. And it was a story of Walt Disney, one of my all-time heroes, by the way. I love that story so much that I wanted you to share that story with the Seven Hatters, if you remember it. I hope sure. you do. Sure. You know, I remember it vividly. By the way, when I was nine years old, we went to Disneyland. We drove Route 66 we started out in Arkansas, picked up Route 66 in Oklahoma, drew, drove all the way across the nation uh, to California and went to the brand new Disneyland in the first year it was open. It opened in, in wow. the summer of, of 55. 
we went in the summer of 56. I may have been one of the first wow. people from Arkansas to ever go to Disneyland. Um, but I never met Walt Disney. However, I met a friend, a very good friend of Walt Disney, Art Linkletter. Now, yep. let's go back to my quote. The future you see defines the person you need to be. It also defines the person you'll probably be. So if you see for yourself a dark and dismal and meaningless future, you're going to be a pretty disgusting and miserable individual. Because you're not yep. going to have a reason to get up in the morning and cultivate the skills and develop the, the knowledge and abilities that make you able to make a difference in life. You're just going to trudge through and, and go from beer to TV show to sleep. So if you change your future view, you say, you know, I could, I could, I could be a podcast host. Man, no telling how many people you reach if you're a podcast host. Hmm. Well, you're not going to do that in your current state. You have to know something. You have to develop some skills. You have to master a little bit of technology. Others can help. But you've got to be a good communicator. So that may require you going to class, reading books, practicing skills, overcoming some uh, you know, challenging uh, difficulties, like maybe you have a speech impediment or whatever. You can still do it. I've got a friend who's a professional speaker. He has no arms. He was born without them. Everything he does, he does with his his voice or his feet. Um, I had wow. Alvin Law lives in Canada. Very successful. Uh, I have a, a friend who's confined to a wheelchair from a back injury he sustained in his twenties, and um, he can't use his hands except you know by using his shoulders to manipulate them. He doesn't have any grip. And he, he can't use his legs, and, and he travels occasionally alone in a wheelchair to speaking engagements all around the country to encourage other people. Wow. And he has built a multi-million dollar business, a ranching business in Utah. His name's Chad Hymas, and he's one of the most inspiring authors and speakers I've ever met. Just a genuine, wonderful individual. I know a, a man named W. Mitchell, and Mitchell, when he was in his 20s, I think, was a uh, motorcycle delivery guy in San Francisco and had an accident, and the gasoline poured all over him and burned him horribly, disfigured mm -hmm. his face, very gruesome disfiguration. Luckily, he had his helmet on, so he retained his hair, but he, he lost everything. You know, they had to rebuild his face, many, many surgeries. And he lost wow. his hands and couldn't use them. They burned off, burned off. He just has little nubs where his hands used to be. He overcame all that and recovered and ultimately went into business for himself with some friends selling, ironically, wood burning stoves. Uh, go figure. Anyway, and became pretty successful at it. And he was flying, a, he got a pilot's license, you know, to use adapted devices and fly a plane. And he was flying a plane. Now, he could walk and get around, but he had this, this gruesomeness and, and the hand problem. He was flying his plane, and on takeoff, it crashed and broke his back. So here it comes again. And now he's confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. So he became a radio commentator. He's got a beautiful voice and became mayor of Crested Butte, Colorado. And after that, became a professional speaker and author and has been all over the world and earned millions upon millions of dollars, inspiring mil millions of people. And he's got a home in uh, Molokai and a home in Santa Barbara. And for a while, he had a home in Australia. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, it just makes me turn to other people and say, what's your excuse? What's your excuse? Yeah. It's just Storm, amazing. Yes. You know, burned horribly, can't use anything below your neck. Uh, and what's your excuse? <laughs> you know, when I say, hey, you know what? The mail hadn't come yet. It's already three o'clock. Well, shame on me. You know, go hide in a closet and whine. Don't do it in front of other people, for heaven's sakes. What's your problem, Jim? <laughs> okay. so. Art Linkletter is, is, was a member, he passed away, but he was a member of the National Speakers Association, which is about 4,000 professional speakers, authors, and celebrities. 
And I joined that in 1976 when I was a new speaker and trainer just starting out. And I joined it so I could be around all my heroes and figure out what they do so I could grow up to be like them. In 1988 and 89, I was the president, national president of that, and had done a lot of things, written books and given speeches all over creation. And so at our convention, we had Art Linkletter as one of the keynoters. And I had given my presentation and I was backstage and Art Linkletter was the next presenter and he was backstage. And he was talking to three or four of us back there. And he told a story about when he and Walt Disney, who were best friends, took a family trip together to Copenhagen. And while they were there, they were wandering around through the beautiful place, uh, Tivoli Gardens. And Walt Disney's taking notes. And Linkletter said, Walt, what are you doing? He said, look at the, the trees. He said, what about them? He said, see the little twinkle lights in the trees? Yeah. None of them are burned out. And he's writing it down. He said, have you seen the benches? What? They're freshly painted. And the bathrooms are clean. And he's writing all this down. And, and Linkletter said, so why, why is this significant to you? And Walt Disney, before Disneyland ever existed or before all the things we know about Disney except his early films existed, said, Art, someday I'm going to build a place like this for families. Disneyland was taking shape in the mind and heart of Walt Disney at that moment, and Art Linkletter had the privilege of being there to witness it and being involved in it. Wow, the future you see tells you what kind of person you're going to need to be to make it happen. And I have a story for you. Okay. Roy Disney, being interviewed at Epcot Center, Walt's brother, yep. Walt has passed. Yep. A reporter asks Roy, isn't this a shame? that Walt could not see this. What a beautiful place. What an epic place. And Roy, with a smirk, turns over to the, to, turns to the reporter and said, no, 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 my friend. Walt did see this. That's why you're seeing it now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? That, those are the end caps. that exists starts first in the mind, somebody's mind. You know, you can look around at any su substantial thing and it's pretty easy to trace it back to somebody had the idea of doing that. And it, so it all starts with one individual. I mean, everything, everything. The Eiffel Tower started with one individual. The, you know, entire great city started with one person. Hey, why don't we stop the wagon here? Right. So you and I are one person. And what we start in our life at many different points in our life, could end up changing, literally changing the direction of the world. Wow. Absolutely. For the good or the bad. Absolutely. So we've got to For the good or the bad. Responsibility. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people do aspire to become great in some way, you know, maybe even as great as Walt. Some of us make it and some of us actually don't achieve the success we aspire to. So let's go back to the nurture your nature, Yeah. right? What is your view on the nature versus nurture debate and how does that apply to the acorn, right? How much does nurture and how much does nature affect the ability for the acorn of becoming a mighty oak, okay. right? What determines their fate? Well, there's been a great deal of research done on that. It boils down to it's about half and half, but it, uh, it, for most people that, when they say that. But I'm convinced it's a great deal more the nurture side, the things you do and the way you you deal with the person than it is the nature side, the basic DNA molecule and what it's capable of. Because they found that if you nurture children, if you pick them up and hold them and coo and talk to them and, and sing to them and treat them well, when they're little tiny babies, their brain literally develops differently than if you neglect them. During World War II in England, during the bombing of London, the babies, the little children and babies were evacuated to uh, remote areas where they could be watched over, where they were unlikely to get bombed. But the problem was there were too many kids and not enough adults. And so the kids didn't get much uh, adult attention. And a lot of the babies were dying from lack of nurture, and not from illness, wow. but from lack of nurture. And so they, they discovered that 
and they realized it, and they started a regular rotation of going around and doing nothing more than picking up the babies and talking to them and, you know, stroking them and things like that. And it made a profound difference in the survival rate of the babies. So there's, there's an absolute need for us to nurture each other and to nurture ourselves uh, in whatever ways we can, because our brain will literally develop more fully with nurture than without it. And uh, now, once you're 10 years old or a little bit older, most of your brain has come online. Most of the pieces of it that are going to be there throughout life have grown to the point that they're developed enough and they're starting to take in information and do their little processes. So age 10 or so, 10, 11, 12, is an enormous time of imprinting and direction setting. Like my age 9, 10, going to Disneyland was humongous, big deal in my life. When I got to Disneyland, nine years old, I was with my mom and dad and little sister, Kathy, and with my uncle and aunt and their three sons, Bruce, Brian, and Johnny. They, they lived in San Diego, and so we were staying with them when we arrived in California. And my uncle said, hey, there's a wonderful new place called Disneyland. We should go. It's in a bunch of orange fields and orchards up in Anaheim, but it's worth the trip. Let's go. And of course, I'd heard about it on TV. And, and uh, so we all jumped in the car and took off and went to Disneyland. So we get there, and, and I found out that my cousins, of course, had been there a couple times already. So they kind of knew the park. And uh, you pay one, one payment at the gate, and you can ride all the rides. So you don't have to go stand in line to get a ticket and then stand in line to get on the ride. You just stand in line to get on the ride, and you're in. Any ride in the whole park. So Bruce, Brian, and Johnny took little Jimmy, me, and we went one direction. And Mom and Aunt Saxon took Kathy and went another direction, and Dad and Uncle John went on their own. And we all agreed, 3 o'clock, we're going to meet at City Hall at the entrance to Disneyland. So off we go, and the first stop for us boys is Tomorrowland. And they had a ride, they still have it, called Autopia. And it's, it's just basically little electric cars that you drive around the track. And back then it may have been gas powered. But if you're big enough, if, if you can, you know, you're as tall as the sign that's outside. If you're that tall, then you can drive the car yourself. But if you're shorter than the sign, then you have to have an attendant drive the car and you just sit in it. Well, I wanted to drive yep. the car, but when I stood up, didn't, you know, I didn't make it. I wasn't tall enough yet. So I got in the car and we went around the track and that was nice, but it wasn't as much fun as I wanted it to be. So I, I got out and I went out the exit and I looked for Bruce and Brian and Johnny and nobody there. And I kept looking, still nobody there. And it, I'm getting worried. So I'm calling out, you know, Bruce, Johnny, you know, and nothing. And so I didn't know there were two exits and they're at the other exit waiting for me. And so they're calling out to me and I'm calling out to them and there's a building in between and we don't know it. So I start yeah. crying and I'm having a meltdown, you know, <laughs> I'm standing there right there like that. And, and I, all of a sudden I had this awareness come over me, Jim, you're in Disneyland. This is the happiest place on earth. This is the only time you're ever going to be here. Probably stop crying. And I said, that's right. I got places to see. So I took off on my own. <laughs> and I spent the next five hours at age nine alone in Disneyland. And I did it all. I went to the, you know, Tom Sawyer Island. I dug around in the caves. I went to the, to the fort, Fort Apache. I, I rode on the riverboat. I, I, um, got on stage at the Golden Horseshoe Saloon with a bunch of other kids and sang, Davy, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild <laughs> Frontier. And uh, I went on the Jungle Cruise. And then when I was in Fantasyland, I, I saw my mom and aunt and little sister at the teacups. And uh, they said, well, where are your cousins? I don't know. Well, come with us. So, you know, I went with them. And then three o'clock, we go back to the city hall and my cousins are late showing up because they still hadn't found Cousin Jimmy. And all day long, they've been looking for him. 
and to you know with no success and so they come up like this we lost Kevin Jimmy and then there they see me <laughs> where have you been you know anyway it was a it was an amazing day that was very powerful for me and you say where did you get the courage to do that well courage comes from a lot of things you know it could come from faith in yourself or faith in a system that you'd been taught or faith in somebody else's belief in you, like Harold Gash believing in me, you know. In this case, it was my belief in the opportunity. The the greatness of the opportunity made my fears insignificant by comparison. So, Hmm. okay, I'm afraid, but I got to do this. You know, it's worth worth the, the effort. And so I did it. And uh, that's, that's kind of a big deal to me. Wow, I love that. Speaking of character traits, that's what you had been honing even as a young child. So I've been studying leaders and mega successful individuals pretty much all my life. And I know that you've met some incredibly successful people in your career. Yeah. I'd be very curious to know what do you think the ultra successful have in common and what separates them from all of us mere mortals? One thing only. One thing only. Spring it on us. And, and let me back into it. Nobody, not one of them, succeeded by accident. Mm. Not a single one of them just stumbled into being Tom Cruise or LeBron James or, or uh, <laughs> even the Kardashians. Then nobody stumbled into it and said, oh, son of a gun, I'm successful. Huh, who knew? Every single one of them decided in advance to succeed. And I don't mean to just be moderately successful. They succeeded beyond all the people that they felt they could compare themselves to. They said, I'm going to be number one. I'm going to be the best. I'm going to set a record. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to make a mark that will last. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get my name on that marquee. And if you don't have those dreams, don't worry about it. Most people shouldn't aspire to that level because there's not room for everybody at the top, but there's room for those that are willing to pay the price and endure the pain and, and go the distance, right? Uh, th- those people have the same fears and doubts that we do, the same insecurities. They have the same setbacks. You know, most of them have had a huge tragedy or two or three or five in their careers or in their lives. Um, you know, I've had, I've been betrayed by business associates and, and lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've been humiliated and, and abused, uh, not physically, but uh, abused through the works of other people that were jealous of me and, and wanted to harm my reputation or harm me personally so that they would look better by comparison. I've, I've tried things that I thought would work and I put everything I had into it and pfft, nothing, you know. So I've, I've had those two and I've had, uh, I had cancer, prostate cancer and had to have a, a radical prostatectomy and, and uh, I, I, was running mountain trails at age 62 and setting personal records and feeling great about myself for the first time in my life. I was seriously physically fit. And then I fainted on a a mountain trail and a friend of mine, a doctor said, you need to get checked. And I went to the hospital and they said, you need a pacemaker. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not ready to get old. Tell me what I need to do. I will endure the pain and pay the price to get beyond this. They said, there's nothing known you can do except a pacemaker. And it took me about eight or 10 months to finally cave in and agree. Okay. Okay. I realize you were telling the truth. There's nothing else I can do. Put it in. But I had always thought a pacemaker meant you're going to be walking with a walker and a tube up your nose for oxygen. They said, no, you can run marathons. You can compete in the Olympics with a pacemaker. I said, well, okay. Since, yeah. since I intend to live a robust life, let's make it happen, get it over with. So they put it in, and I've never had an issue since, and I'm still able to you know, run mountain trails, play rock and roll music in nightclubs, lift weights. And for the last five years, I've done 100 push-ups every day without missing a day that I didn't make up the day after. 100 push-ups a day for five consecutive years, and my initial goal was to do them for 10 days. 
And wow. and I had to do them, you know, 15, then 10, then 15 or 20, and then 10, and that, like that at first. And then I got to where I could do 70 or 80 nonstop, and then go back on my knees, catch my breath, and do the last 20 or 30. And all of that after age 60. No, let's see, five years, I'm, well, after age 70. Starting at age 70, that's what I did. Now, back in 1976, when I got the job at the USJC's national headquarters, after starting out as a local chapter member, I was overweight and I decided to jog and I started doing that, but I couldn't make myself do it. So I said, well, I, what can I make myself do? I can make myself put on my running shoes every day and step to the curb. Yeah, but that's ridiculous. No, that's the first step. And if I go to the curb with running shoes on, I'm likely to either walk or run. And if I don't, I'm not likely to. So with that little commitment that I would always, no matter what, rain, shine, heat, snow, always put on my running shoes sometime today and walk out to the curb, I ended up most of the time walking or running the better part of a mile and then five miles nonstop and then running half marathons and that sort of thing. And I dropped 52 excess pounds. I had quit smoking a, a few years before and I got in, in good physical shape, but not the shape I was in at age 62. At age 62, I was ripped. Man, I was, you know, I, I was in a group of 60 people and I was one of the three fastest on the mountain trail. And that's all, and that's all with the belief that you want to be super successful in life and everything that you well, do, no, right? Well, no, I didn't have the desire, like the you know, like a a major movie star or an athletic celebrity or somebody. I didn't, or, or a Tony Robbins, you know. I didn't aspire to that level. My my aspiration was to be like Earl Nightingale, to become the leading authority in my a leading authority in my niche. And I literally, when I wrote it down said, I will be one of the top 10 best known, most admired and influential, best known, most admired and influential people involved in the field of professional speaking and training. And I achieved wow. it. And now I've, I've literally, I've been honored to receive every major award in the entire world of professional speaking and training the Cavett Award from the National Speakers Association, Lifetime Achievement Award from the same group, the Golden Gavel Award from the third of a million members of Toastmasters International. I've got a TED Talk with 2.5 million views, which places it in the top 1% of the top 1% of all the TED Talks. And there are a lot of them, more yep. than 100,000. Uh, it's an incredible talk, by the way. Thank Everybody you. Should, and it's only it eight up. minutes long, eight and a half minutes long. And I, yeah. I felt I did about a seven out of 10 in the performance because they cut my time from 12 minutes to 10. And I came in at eight, but I lost the spontaneity and playfulness I planned to put into it. Uh, but it became successful anyway, because it was on the subject of how to believe in yourself, which most people don't know. Um and in September, just a few months ago, I was honored to receive an honorary business degree from High Point University in North Carolina, which is not a university where I've made a big donation or I've played some profound role. My colleague, the president of the university, Dr. Nito Kubain, called me and said, do I remember correctly you don't have a degree even though you're a college professor and you write college textbooks? I said, yeah. He said, well, we'd like to give you one. And so oh, I flew out great. there with my family and, and uh, wow, wow. And that's at 75 years old, for heaven's sakes. Yeah. Well, with all those accomplishments, I mean, that's, it, it's only because of your life experience. So let's, let's switch a little bit okay. uh, topics. Well, it's not really switching topics, but let's talk about Tim Seward. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of your conversation that you once had with him, he asked you a question, uh, and I just, I was like, wow, that's an incredible answer that you gave him. Thank you. Can you tell the seven hatters what that question was I and will. what Matter of fact, was your response? I have to put on a hat to do that. I, was, there we I go. was hired by Tidy Car, which was an auto detailing company out of Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, to do a series of presentations, including a keynote speech 
at their uh, international convention. But first I was hired to do a little seminar in Chicago in January of 1979, which was a month that Chicago got dumped on, you know, like two, three feet of snow. It was miserable up there. So I went to this seminar and conducted it, and it was how to build your business. It was for young entrepreneurs who were new owners of the tidy car franchise for their neighborhood or their part of town. Tim Seward was a 19-year-old kid from Bay City, Michigan, near Saginaw, who came. He had scraped together $1,500 and bought a franchise. So he was the tidy car guy, the auto detailer for Bay City, Michigan. And here he is sitting there just innocent looking, white hair and uh, innocent looking face, 19 years old, taking notes like crazy. At the end of my seminar or in the middle of my seminar, he said, could I have lunch with you? And I said, sure. So we sat together at lunch and he asked me a thousand questions. And he said, he said, can I ask you one last question? And I said, okay. And he said, do you have a quote? I said, what do you mean a quote? He said, you know, a slogan, a motto, a saying, something I can use every day to motivate myself. And I said, no. And he said, no. And I said, no, I have something better. I have a question. And he said, oh, okay, what's the question? How would the person I'd like to be do the things I'm about to do? That's something that I call the daily question. And uh, I'd gotten that from my friend and mentor, Joe Willard of Mass Mutual Life Insurance Company. He always asked himself when he started out, how would the agency sales leader do the things I'm about to do? And so he always upgraded his own behavior to a higher level by using himself in the future as a role model. So I said this to Tim, ask yourself every day, how would the person I'd like to be do the things I'm about to do? Who would you like to be? He said, I would like to be the international sales leader for Tidy Car. I said, that's kind of a big deal. He said, yeah, there are people worldwide with Tidy Car franchises, but I want to be the guy. And I said, okay, how would you do that differently? That's what you need to ask yourself every day. So he went home to Bay City and he looked at everything he was doing from the way he dressed to the practices he had day to day. And he changed the way he dressed, which was T-shirt and jeans or jacket to a, a jumpsuit, you know, a pair of coveralls that said tidy car on the back and Tim on the pocket and looked more professional. And then the way he organized his work, he organized it better because he wanted to be the international leader. And he knew the international sales leader that year would win a brand new Corvette, Chevrolet Corvette automobile. So he went down to the Chevy dealer and asked for a test drive. And uh, it was interesting. They said, do you have a driver's license? Because he looked really young. He said, yeah, here. And they said, do you, do you really think you could buy one of these? He said, I'll have one soon, which was not a lie. So he drove the Corvette and he came home with a big brochure which had a blue Corvette in it. And it was a big fold out, like a centerfold in a magazine. And he put that over his bed and he put one over his workbench in the garage. And he took uh, what they call uh, correct type, which was a little pasty white thing. And he painted them white with that. That used it with typewriters, you know, when things would come out with, with errors, you'd use that little white paste to fix it. So he, he did that and created this white scaly looking version of what had been blue and looked at it every day and said, how would the international sales leader, the guy who would win that Corvette, do the things I'm about to do? And it changed the way he solved problems, the way he dealt with customers, the way he managed himself, the way he managed his own emotions and so forth. And when he went to the international convention, he knew he had a shot. He didn't know whether he had won. But I was the speaker, the featured speaker at that convention in New Orleans that year. And at the big banquet with the Corvette on the stage, they announced the international sales leader's name. And they said, the person in position number two led number three by only two points. Three led four by one point, four led five by one point, five led six by a couple of points. But the leader, the one who wins that Corvette, won with 300 more points than number two. Wow. He said, for first place, there was no contest. Welcome with me, your international sales leader, 
Tim Seward. The place went nuts. Everybody loved and admired Tim. They jumped to their feet and screamed and cheered and carried him around on their shoulders and brought him up to the stage. I gave him a hug and congratulated him. I said, what in the world did you do? He said, I just did what you said in Chicago. I said, what was it that was so good that I said in Chicago? And he laughed and he said, the daily question, how would the person I'd like to be do the thing I'm about to do? He said, and I figured the international sales leader, when he was going to New Orleans, would go first class one way. I said, now, Tim, you didn't know you'd won. Doesn't that seem a little foolhardy? He looked at the Corvette and he looked back at me. He said, you think I'm going to need a ride home? And I laughed and said, no, I'm good for you. But see, Tim aspired to be that. And whether he'd won it that year or not wouldn't have been significant. He could have come in second or fifth or whatever. But he had put in the effort to put his name on the marquee, to win, to be the guy, the only guy, and to win the Corvette. The second year, they gave away a Cadillac to Tim Seward. The third year, I think he won again, and then he sold his business to someone else and invested in a company that supplied tidy car type businesses. And he built that business to a point where he sold it for six million dollars, no, seven million dollars, and retired before he was 30 years old and moved to Florida and flew around the world and, you know, saw the places he wanted to see with his family and then uh, managed his investments. And I was down there wow. with him one day and I saw all this lifestyle of the rich and famous. And I said, Tim, I just got one question. Do you have a motto, a slogan, a saying that I could <laughs> use? And he just laughed. And he said, yeah, how would the person I'd like to be do the things I'm about to do? So isn't that a beautiful story? It is, it's a beautiful story. And more importantly, doesn't it feel great to know that the people that you affected throughout your career, you know, when they come back to you and speak with you about and tell their stories on their yeah. success, there's got to be nothing more gratifying, not money, not, no, not accomplishment, that's, that's not, not no, no, yeah. no awards. Well, you know, people say, what's your proudest accomplishment? And my answer is my son. He turned out to be the person I want to grow up to be. You know, he's a man I admire. He's my closest, most intimate friend. And he's got two kids, and they're turning out like that. You know, in the Bible, it says, by their fruits, you shall know them. So I'm measuring me by the way my, my works have worked out. And my primary project was raising my son to be a good person who would live an abundant life and raise kids that were of a similar mindset. And sure enough, you know, he and his wife, Sonia, have raised two wonderful kids that are 18 and 20 right now, both in college. And I admire so much about each of them. So, whew. and a lot of people, yeah. you know, some of the most successful and inspiring people in my field that I've ever run across have not been as fortunate and not been as blessed with with their own family, you know, they've, they've struggled with helping their kids become well-adjusted, uh, happy, meaningful, and focused people. And I don't think it's a weakness on the part of my colleagues. I think it's, it's just they were dealing with a different situation and coming at it from a very different angle. And um, they weren't blessed with, you know, the, like in my case, my son, our son, was uh, a good acorn to start with, I think. I, there was a whole lot of the nature was right, so the nurture helped. That Absolutely. Well, there was so much there. I, I would be remiss not to ask you just a couple of questions. Yeah. I know we're running out of time, but just a couple of questions on relationships. You mm-hmm. know, you're, you're a relationship expert, and I believe relationships are really the keys to success as we discuss with our wives. Well, no one makes it alone, that's for sure. No one. No one makes it alone. Yep. And it's, I think it's even more than talent, right? Like Stephen Covey, Habit number four asks us to win-win, right? Yep. Stephen also said that in relationships, the little things are the big things. So That's right. you speak of relationship leverageability. What is relationship leverageability? And does it apply to habit number four, think win-win? Absolutely. Absolutely. I wrote the book Relationship Selling, which ended up being nine books and uh, has become a whole trend around the world. Uh, but I was the first to champion that concept uh, under that title, at least. 
and I wrote it back in the early 1980s. And the concept is not be nice to people selling. It's relationship selling, meaning you consider a relationship to be an asset or a liability. You know, a relationship with a serial killer, probably not good for you. A relationship with, with one of the most inspiring people on earth, very good for you. Yeah. I had the honor of, of sharing the platform uh, in a series for Century 21 real estate conventions with Dr. Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits. And he was doing yep. The Seven Habits back in the 1970s, and I was doing relationship selling or a version of it and, um, and talking about goal setting and things like that. Um, and then over the years, you know, I, I hired one of his vice presidents, Dr. Blaine Lee, to work with me on the book, The Acorn Principle, and work with my company. And uh, Stephen Covey hired me to be part of a master's series that he was doing at a uh, uh, program out at San Diego State University. So great things happen when you're in the right gathering of people. But let's look at the, at the root question. What is a relationship? I've asked, I don't know, 300 audiences that question, never got a consistent answer. I got similar answers, but never the same answer. So I came up with my own answer. Here's my answer to that question. A relationship uh -huh. is, and every word in this is very intentional, a direct connection between people. You can't have a relationship with things. A direct connection between people in which value is exchanged. Now, what's valuable to you may be opening doors or providing opportunities or giving you money. What's valuable to me might be saving more time to spend with my family or being allowed to be an insider with a special group of VIPs I admire. You know, so value is different to different people. But a relationship's only a relationship if value is being exchanged through a direct connection with another person. Well, no, you have a relationship with your dog. Yeah, and that's fine, but that's irrelevant to what we're talking about. You have a relationship with a company? No, you do not. You have a relationship with the individuals that constitute that company. Yep. And if those individuals weren't there, the relationship you have would no longer exist. So you'd have to reestablish it. So if you think of a relationship that way, then what's the most fundamental beginner spot of a relationship? It's a transaction. Toll booth operator and you. You pull up. 50 cents, please. Here's your 50 cents. Next. Okay, that's not a relationship. That's a transaction. So you always go to the same toll booth lane and you always see the same person and smile at them. Now you've, you're exchanging a little bit of value. They smile back. One day they say, hey, have a nice day. This one's on me. The relationship is growing. Ultimately, the two of you end up in a business partnership and become best friends for life. Now, that relationship went from nothing to something that you never want to let go of. Well, every relationship follows that continuum, and there are touch points along that, that continuum that you could learn how to get people to this level and then take them to the next level and next and next. And some relationships, you can't tell whether they're worth investing in or not. Others, you can pretty much tell I shouldn't bother spending much time on this. If it's a good one, they'll let me know. But otherwise, I'm going to spend my time with you. You're a podcast show host, and you're a person that, with a good heart, and I like you, and you got a good smile, right? So I'm going to build on this one. But that's what relationships are about. And if you look at your life as a series of connections with other people, if your relationships are with people that are substantial people, whether they achieve great things yet or not, then your life is going to become more meaningful and more substantial. If you associate with people with loser attitude, people who are depressed or cynical or whatever, you know, they may be fun or funny or they may may drink your brand of, of intoxicant, but that's, that's going nowhere except taking you down the same deep well with them. You should go shopping for who you spend most of your time with. Yeah. Jim Rohn said exactly that. Jim Rohn said that you're the average of the five people you associate with the most. Yeah. And Charlie Tremendous Jones, a um, uh, guy who was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, one of the famous early motivational speakers, he said, 
You are the same person today that you will be five years from now, except for two things. The books you read today, that would be the things you learn and the people you meet. Yep. Right. And Jim Rohn and I had the I had the honor of being inducted as one of the five people, if the same five people that were inducted in the Professional Speakers Hall of Fame in 1989, along with my then partner, Dr. Tony Alessandra and Jim Rohn. And I was at wow. Jim Rohn's memorial service in Anaheim with 2000 other people paying homage to this powerful. What an incredible man. human being. He oh, was yeah. such an incredible human yeah. being. He birthed so many. Oh, Tony Robbins worked for him. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, among them. Incredible other. stuff. Well, listen, Jim, another great Jim. We're running out of time, and I want to ask you one final question. Okay. I like to close on my interviews with this. Who did you have to stop being, and who did you need to become to manifest all your current success? Well, when I was back... In Arkansas, I was working at the housing authority. I was 50 pounds overweight, as I had mentioned to you earlier, and smoking two packs of cigarettes a day, expecting to have a very ordinary, unremarkable life. And in the mornings, when it was time to go to work, my wife would literally, literally have to pull me to a sitting position in bed to get me to fully wake up and go ahead and go to work because I just, you know, I'd roll over and pretty much say, go away. I'm still sleeping. So I was a slug, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it, I, I was a loser, but I was a nice one. You know, a likable loser is basically what I was a, a good guy and not going to be dishonest or, you know, commit crimes or anything like that. And I do what I said I would do, but I wasn't saying enough to require me to be a bigger person in order to do it. So I had to stop being that guy. And that's why those Earl Nightingale recordings from his series called Lead the Field, the one thing I could do was I could listen to those audio cassettes every single wow. day. And I became truly fanatical about it to the point that I never let a day pass that I didn't listen at least two or three times to whichever message I was focused on that week. And I would listen to it over and over and over again because the, he was so eloquent and, so, and the message was so important. But I knew I had to reprogram my own worldview and assumptions about myself and others and life in general if I was to get to a higher place. I don't know how I knew it, but I knew it. And so I, I kept reinforcing the new until finally the old just sort of disappeared or dissipated. It's like Buckminster Fuller said, if you want to change something, don't focus on, on removing what's there. Build the new and make it so effective that it makes the old obsolete. And the old just drifts by the wayside, you know, naturally. And so that's what I was doing with my own thinking and transforming me you know, and, the, and I went from the lower levels, you know, of, of just focusing on little things to the higher levels, you know, and, and doing my service in the Army and then learning to play guitar and then sending my son to the university, even though I only went for a short while myself, getting into the world of motorcycling and becoming a life member of the American Motorcyclists Association after having 18 bikes and riding all over the world, getting the degree that I told you about from High Point University, even getting to know Michael Reagan, the son of Ronald Reagan, and becoming friends with him, and then being chairman of the first public event ever held at the Ronald Reagan Library uh, Air Force One Pavilion, which was a fundraiser for the Boys and Girls Clubs that raised a quarter of a million dollars in one night. So, you know, I went from from the earliest part of this interview, the little guy in Little Rock, Arkansas, that that didn't believe his life was going to be much to being able to touch people all over the world with 22 books translated into multiple languages. And and uh, from 2015 to 2019, December, uh, I lectured all over mainland China to hundreds of thousands of people 
uh, through an interpreter in 23 major cities on untold number of trips and have four books that are translated into Mandarin. So, oh my God, wow. who knew all this was possible? I didn't. So I couldn't have set it as a goal to start with. And I didn't even know much of this existed so that it could become a goal. So all you got to do is just point yourself in the direction of the life you would like to have that you dream of having, and then acquire the qualities that make you worthy of that life. So be a magnet for what you want, and it will come to you as a byproduct of being that kind of person instead of only being an arrow trying to get to what you want. What a way to end this interview. And for those who are just listening to the audio version, Jim literally put on like 15 hats <laughs> right now that he collected along the way. I specifically had seven selected for today, but then a few others made their way in. So Jim, in closing, how could the seven hatters find you? What, is, what do they need to know? They need to know my name and that's about it. Jim Cathcart, C-A-T-H-C-A-R-T, on YouTube, on uh, Getter, G-E-T-T-R, which is a replacement for Twitter. Uh, I'm not on Twitter anymore. Uh, Instagram, on uh, Facebook, on LinkedIn, it's Cathcart Institute. Um, Gad, you know, Ted, you know, TEDx Talks. You look me up, Jim Cathcart, how to believe in yourself. I'm pretty easy to find. There are hundreds of thousands of, of links out there that have my videos or have articles I've written or whatever, and I'm still producing them at a breakneck speed today and having a blast doing it, still riding my motorcycle, still playing rock and roll in clubs and, and uh, at special events and, and writing books and articles and consulting with, with clients. My, my new uh, brand is your virtual vice president. Put me at your elbow, put me on a retainer and let me just be there for you as you grow your own life and career and business. So many people in their 70s are just waiting to die oh, and you're literally it. starting yeah. to live. And, and I love that about you. You know, I got to close out with this. Jim Rohn was, is my mentor. And now Jim Cathcart is my mentor. Thank you for gracing Bless us, for you. honoring us with all those years of knowledge. I hope to maybe have you on the show again Thank to you. instill Thank some you more. So much. And I appreciate your time. You bet. What a wonderful thing to say. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jim. Let's end today with the segment of the show that I refer to as, What Can We Hang Our Hat On? And here's my takeaway. Jim tells the story of Walt Disney and Art Linkletter on their trip to Copenhagen, walking in Tivoli Gardens. That was the time that Walt imagined the future of Disneyland. And I believe that back then, Disney, in his mind's eye, saw the sights. He felt the crowds. He smelt the sense, and he believed in the impact that his dream would have on the world. When speaking to success principles, Jim relayed his number one trait that every uber successful person has, and that is nobody, not one successful person succeeded by accident. Not a single one of them just stumbled into it. They succeeded because of their belief that they will be the best, number one the greatest of all time. Is it easy to achieve world-class status? 1,000% absolutely not. Let's look at Disney. He faced multiple bankruptcies, a mental breakdown, a devastating strike, the loss of control over his creation, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. And as far as the happiest place on earth, it was rumored that he was rejected over 300 times by bankers and financiers. How many of us would give up? just after a handful. Well, many would. And that's why it's lonely at the top. Walt said once, you may not realize it when it happens, but a kick in the teeth may be the best thing in the world for you. And it sure was for Walt. His tenacity and perseverance were key to his success. But that walk in Tivoli Gardens was the reason he succeeded at the end. He had a vision and he believed he could do it. What's your vision? How will you impact the world? And yes, I'm talking to you. Let's follow Jim's advice and bring vision and belief into play and you'll be on your way to greatness. 
Jim and I believe in you. And so does Disney. I want to thank Jim once again for joining me so that we can all benefit from his wisdom. And until next time, if you found this episode helpful, please hit that subscribe button and tell other entrepreneurs out there what value you receive from it so that we can attract even more high quality people into our Seven Hats community. So for now, I will bid you farewell and success on your journey. And until next time, my name is Yuval Selleck, and I tip my hat to you.